this here. Yeah. Welcome to the Royal Netherlands Academy of Sciences. Tonight is a special evening because we celebrate the laureates of the 2021 Abel Prize. The Abel Prize is the Nobel Prize for Mathematics, and it is awarded yearly by the Norwegian Academy of Science. Here at the Trippenhuis in Amsterdam, it has become a tradition to highlight the work of the laureate or laureates during a special evening aimed at a broad audience. And tonight, we're particularly fortunate because both laureates have accepted our invitation to come to Amsterdam to be present at this meeting and to speak, Avi Bitkerson and Laszlo Lovas. So a very warm welcome to both of you. Uh, we have a full house with uh, lots of participants on location, wonderful, and also lots of participants online. Also, uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us online. My name is Frank Den Hollander. I'm a professor of mathematics at Leiden University, and I will act as the chair for this symposium. We have prepared a nice program for you. In the first hour, Avi Wittersen will speak, and his work will be introduced by Harry Buurman. And in the second hour, Lars Lovis will speak, and his work will be introduced by Lex Schreiber. And after each session, there will be opportunity for you to ask uh, questions. Please do. You're very much invited to do so. And I wish everybody a very nice uh, symposium. So I propose that we get started. Harry, can I invite you to uh, introduce Avi? Yeah. That's good. Stare, yes. Ah, here we have this thing. So welcome uh, everyone, and uh, and especially, and I'm very honored uh, to welcome both Avi Victorson and Latsi uh, Lovash. Uh, it's fantastic to have you both here tonight, um, and to somehow have a, a sports metaphor. It's uh, it's not an evening where you only have Messi to kick the ball around with you. But in addition, also Ronaldo is there. So fantastic. Um, and to me, it's the honor to uh, introduce uh, Avi and his work. So first, uh, a little bit about um, his, um, his curriculum vitae. Uh, Avi was uh, born in 56 uh, in, uh, in Haifa in Israel. And then he did an uh, undergraduate in computer science at uh, Technion. Uh, and then he moved over across the ocean to Princeton University, where he uh, did a PhD, and, and uh, his thesis was entitled Studies in Computational Complexity. And then uh, he moved back again to Israel, where he got a faculty position at the Hebrew University. And then finally, once more, he moved over back to Princeton, uh, where he now is uh, full-time at the Institute for Advanced Study. And um, of course, he has many honors, and he told me that I shouldn't say all these things about you, but nevertheless, I will. Uh, he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, and an ACM fellow. And moreover, there is also a multitude of prizes that have come his way, the Nevalina Prize, the Gödel Prize, Knut, and now also the Abel Prize, together with, together with Lovars. So fantastic, that's why we are all here. Um, so the field of Avi and also Lovars is both mathematics and computer science, and it is this intersection that uh, that is where they're working and where Avi is working. And this intersection is particularly um, interesting. It combines both computation and mathematics, and that sort of is super interesting because it is also a very revolutionary and powerful tool that uh, has also surprising applications, not only to mathematics and computer science, but actually also to physics and chemistry and biology. But not only that, it also applies to social sciences, economics, and actually the list keeps growing and goes on. And that's why sometimes this field is dubbed 
computational lens. And, and really, why does it have these applications? It's because physical and societal phenomena are really computation. Or you may disagree with that, but it, it turns out that if you think about it that way, that's very useful and you can get a lot out of it. So, this computational lens, that's sort of the, the key that, that makes all these things tick, what is it made out of? What is the fabric of the lens? What are the building blocks? And that's precisely where Avi comes in. Um, first, um, it all starts with uh, complexity theory, and that's understanding the power of computation. And then there's other building blocks like zero knowledge, randomness and de-randomization, interactive proofs, circuit complexity, and many, many more. This list is growing and uh, things get added to it uh, every day almost. And Avi really is a pioneer and a leader and an ambassador with uh, deep uh, contributions to almost all of these fields. Now, you're blushing maybe, Avi? No, no. no. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me so let me sort of um, tip, tip a little bit uh, the first three of these um, of these areas and uh, show how interesting and how surprising some of these results are. So complexity theory sort of begins in some sense with Alan Turing, who in 1936 constructed a mathematical model of computation. And with that, he established uh, not only what computation is, but he also established the boundaries of computation in principle. Now, complexity theory goes one step further and makes it also a lot more complicated and interesting because it tries to establish what you can compute quickly, not what you can compute in principle, but what you can efficiently compute. For example, you can quickly compute from in, uh, when you have a map with cities, the shortest route from A to B. This is actually an algorithm due to Dijkstra, who, uh, who uh, developed it algorithm here in Amsterdam. Um, but now if you change that question a little bit and you ask what is the longest route from A, a to B, which seems sort of harmless, then suddenly we have no fast algorithms anymore. We don't know whether that can be solved quickly or not. And so this question, whether there is a fast algorithm, for the longest route, this is a really deep and open question in mathematics, and it also goes by the name P versus NP problem. And in general, we believe that there is no fast algorithm for this longest path, but we have no proof of that. And so understanding the power and the limits of computation, that is exactly what complexity theory is all about. And uh, another thing that, uh, that Avi has worked in, and that is very surprising, is the notion of zero-knowledge proofs. And here it actually gets very strange. The idea is that I have a proof of some statement, and I want to convince you that I have that proof, but I don't want to make you any wiser than just that. So I don't want you to know any more information than you already knew when you started talking to me. And it seems to be very hard to do, but here's an example of how that might work. So, for example, you meet someone who claims that they can tell apart Pepsi-Cola from Coca-Cola, and now, how are you going to verify this claim? Well, here's a way of doing that. You randomly give this person, and you blindfold her first, and you randomly give her either Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola, and you ask which one was it? Was it Coca-Cola? Was it Pepsi-Cola? And if this person is right, you continue this story, and you do that 100, 100 times. And then, probably, um, this person knows how to tell Pepsi-Cola from Coca-Cola, because just randomly guessing would be uh, that the chance that you succeeded, that would be astronomically small, 1 over 2 to the power 100. That's smaller than the 1 over the number of molecules in the, in the universe. Note, oh, by the way, that no extra information has come across. Right? You still are no wiser about how this person is actually doing this. And so this, in addition, has applications to cryptography, electronic money, and many, many more. So then, to um, say a little bit about the, about the last one, randomness and de-randomization, it turns out that if you equip your algorithms with some kind of randomness that makes them make random moves, then that seems to help a lot, because if you do that, you can get very efficient and fast algorithms for 
a vast array of problems. For example, uh, finding large primes becomes easy, factoring multivariate polynomials, and there's a whole bunch of these problems for which there are fast, randomized algorithms. Now, so it turns out that it appears to be very useful to have this randomness because it allows you to look in random places, and that may be very uh, useful, or that appears to be very useful. And now a very surprising connection comes, and that sort of connects it to this complexity theory. If there is no fast algorithm for this longest route problem, and I'm sort of paraphrasing here a little bit, but this is in essence what's going on, then randomness in algorithms is not needed. And again, this is a very surprising paradigm, hardness versus randomness, that sort of plays an important role in Avi's work. So then, ending on a more personal note, the first time I met Avi, that was in a conference, uh, not surprisingly, called uh, uh, um, Computational Complexity co Conference. At that time, it was called Structures in Complexity. And the first time we met was in Barcelona, which was all very nice. Avi had two, two papers. I was a young student, um, very uh, intrigued by all of that. And then three years later, Avi came to Amsterdam because Complexity Conference was here in Amsterdam. And actually, again, Avi had two papers. And you see here a picture. I think it was taken by Peter van Em de Boas. In this very room, though it, was a, it looked completely different than it looks now, but it was here in this room. I think you were standing here, Avi, um, and that is the picture. And I'm so happy that you have come back uh, 28 years later. Um, a big congratulations to both uh, you and, uh, and Lotzi with winning the Abel Prize. And uh, actually, in the small print, also a big congratulations to the whole field for this recognition. And now, Avi, uh, the floor is yours. Take it away. OK, thanks. Hi, this was uh, yeah. <laughs> excellent, mainly that you didn't go above your 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I don't believe this picture was of mine, because I was not smiling there. So it's uh, anyway, uh, where am I? Uh-huh. OK. Good. Uh, so I, uh, I want to tell you, maybe I'll stand here and we'll look at this, if the remote will work. Uh, I want to tell you about uh, imitation games. It's, uh, it's some kind of a bias survey of uh, my field, computational complexity, but it starts from uh, uh, really the same, uh, you know, Alan Turing that uh, I mentioned. So let me uh, tell you what uh, I'll do. More or less the plan is simple. I mean, I first want to tell you about, maybe some of you know about this, the original imitation game, so-called the Turing test, which talks about intelligence. Uh, so it will be an introduction of a paradigm, and I'll show you the many idea, and then we'll see generalizations, speculations, uh, in this informal setting, and then I'll move to really what happens in major areas of uh, computational complexity, cryptography, randomness, relations to combinatorics, uh, and uh, privacy. These are big areas, but I want to show you how formal uh, definitions which underlie each one of these big fields, uh, you know, carry the same flavor as uh, Turing, its original imitation game. And, uh, this has uh, important consequences, uh, some theoretical, some practical, and then I'll yeah, just conclude. Uh, OK. So, I mean, since it starts with Turing, I just want to say a few words about this uh, great man, one of the greatest thinkers of the previous century. Uh, he did a lot. I'm not going to survey it, but, uh, you know, as a graduate student, he already you know, took care of the first two items here, both the theoretical creation of uh, computer science as a science and igniting the computer revolution. Uh, then came World War II, and he was a major part, uh, as many of you know, of uh, cracking the Enigma machine uh, and uh, probably shortening the war by a couple of uh, years and maybe by a few million people uh, dying. Uh, 
Another thing that's not well known is that uh, he actually worked also in biology, and uh, one of the most cited papers in biology, even in today's standards, is this paper on morphogenesis. And uh, I'm going to talk about his work in artificial intelligence, which today is a big, uh, uh, big field. So uh, he wanted to study this question of intelligence, and uh, he was this very influential paper in 1950 called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. Uh, and he starts the paper, I, you know, I really highly recommend uh, reading Turing's papers. He writes so eloquently, he explains his ideas so wonderfully. Uh, so he starts saying, I want to study the question, can machines think? And then he says, well, I can do it in, in you know, the usual way. Uh, I can try to define what is a machine. I can try to define what is think. Uh, you know, that's a philosophical you know, approach. And then he says, but you'll start arguing with me about these definitions. And instead, let me do something else. Let's just test it. Uh, see whether you know, a machine can think. So he's proposing a test. That's a Turing test. So let me explain what the test is what the framework that we are going to repeat again and again here. Uh, here's the idea of the test, which is uh, called the imitation game. Um, all right. So somebody claims that they build a robot that can think or can, is intelligent, and you want to test it. Um, then, you know, you let a referee, maybe I should just... I stand closer to that. Uh, you let a human referee, you know, be in one of two worlds, either talking to a human or talking to this robot, and uh, decide, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe, you know, in one case it says that's a human, and maybe also in this case it says it's a human, maybe that would be good. For the robot designer, it looks like, you know, uh, the robot can behave as if they were intelligent. Intelligence is just a name. You can say converse with a, converse like a human. Uh, so you can start with some definition. The robot is intelligent according to this test. If, you know, a referee will make the same guess in both worlds. The two worlds are indistinguishable. Of course, You know, there can be, you know, different outcomes, in which case, you know, the robot failed. But I want to stress that it's even better to let the referees, you know, make a, you know, an estimate of how close to a human this, you know, uh, interaction is. And maybe there'll be, uh, you know, two numbers, or maybe we average the results of several such tests, so we get a fraction. And if these fractions are close to each other, then, you know, uh, if the, the two worlds are indistinguishable, we think that the uh, robot is doing pretty well. Now, what uh, Turing stresses is that you don't do it just with one referee, you maybe you have a very different referee, and uh, that other referee, you know, they have just some two numbers, and uh, all you want is that for every referee you apply, you know, the outcome in both these scenarios comes out very close. Doesn't have to be exactly the same, but it comes out very close. How close, of course, is important, but uh, you know, at this uh, at this level, it's an uh, informal statement. If every uh, referee trying to distinguish these two words come up with a similar estimate, then you know they are indistinguishable. So you know, whatever we are testing, like the robot's intelligence, uh, we say that it passes the test. So that's the imitation game. And uh, this, uh, of course, was taken, you know, in many directions, extended, generalized, and can be applied to very other, you know, many other notions that are, you know, uh, not clear. It can be applied to cognition, to emotions, like we can ask, uh, can a computer feel empathy or pain or, you know, other such complex uh, feelings, or maybe it can be conscious or... Uh, self-aware, stuff like that. And uh, the point is that, you know, it's very hard to say, you know, whether, uh, you know, another person, I mean, whether you can tell about me, whether I'm 
you know, conscious, so uh, feel pain, and uh, you know, certainly, you know, maybe not be able to say it about my dog or about other entities in general. And what it points out to is that the, you know, of course, what is being tested here is not, you know, reality, but whether it looks as if. You know, the entity we are uh, testing is similar to what, you know, we think it should be. Uh, so the general approach is that the objective uh, ontological definitions about the meaning of these, uh, you know, notions, maybe, you know, maybe they are not testable, maybe they are falsifi not falsifiable, maybe they don't have a universal meaning. Uh, on the other hand, what Turing suggests is this subjective, uh, you know, sort of behavioral definition. And this turns out, as we'll see, can be, uh, you know, precise and testable and uh, operational and useful in many ways, but they can be really revolutionary. And that's, then they are revolutionary in these examples of these fields I talked about. Okay, so. Uh, what I want to show you is this uh, precise imitation games in these uh, um, four fields. And the paradigm will be the same as in Turing's test, that uh, two things are the same if they cannot be told apart by an appropriate test. How appropriate? Well, this should be relevant to what we are testing, right? So that should be relevant to whatever the application area. And we'll see different uh, uh, imitation games. Uh, so we see formal definitions of such central notions to these fields, and I want to stress that the definitions are primary. This is what you start from. And it's really amazing how it uh, dies. Uh, and once you have the right definitions, then theorems and theories and proofs and constructions, you know, they just follow and create this field we are talking about. So I'll stress, I'll focus on the definitions here. Uh, and, uh, of course, these are huge fields, each of them, and I'll spend, I don't know, seven, eight minutes on it. So I'll focus on these central definitions. And, uh, yeah, we'll see the power of this uh, imitation game paradigm, and, we'll see, you know, it turns out has, you know, impact on math, science, technology, society. Um, yeah, many of them you are very familiar with. Okay, so the first, uh, yeah, you can ask questions. Questions? Okay. Um, okay, so the first is cryptography. It seems if I press five, six times, I see some. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, cryptography, the first two millennia, or maybe five millennia, was focused on encryption. And what is encryption? You know, you um, have some secret message, let's say a general to its, you know, uh, soldiers, it's, you know, either attack or retreat. And of course, you know, you, you want your soldiers to understand it, but you don't want the enemy to understand it. So you encrypt it. So you somehow garble these messages according to some function, encryption function. And you get this garbled thing that hopefully is not understood. And there are many examples of encryption functions through the ages. You know, many people are familiar with Caesar's code. Uh, it's a letter substitution code. And the much more modern Enigma machine was also a letter substitution, but something that's time dependent and key dependent and so on, much more complicated. And actually, I used the first one, Caesar's code, to uh, encrypt the attack and retreat above. So what's the question? The question is, you know, are any of them good? Or what is good? You know, is an encryption a scheme, a particular function, secure or not? Will it, you know, hide the secret from somebody who doesn't know? And really the more basic question, what do we mean by a secure encryption function? And this was mathematically defined in this seminal paper of Goldwasser and Mikali in 81. And the way they define it, I want to stress, this will repeat again and again, using the same paradigm of Turing. You want to set up an imitation game to define what secure encryption is. So what do we want? I mean, they say, okay, what do we want? We have two messages, arbitrary two messages that 
you know, we may want to encrypt, and we use this function. What do we really want? We want that, you know, nobody can tell them apart. If nobody can tell them apart, then they're good. That's, so they say, okay, what, what do you mean nobody? It, any algorithm which looks at one of them, you know, comes up, I have to guess whether it's zero or M0 or M1, comes up with a similar, you know, uh, similar number, similar fraction. So their definition is that an encryption scheme is secure is for any two messages, arbitrary, maybe just zero and one, and any efficient algorithm, any adversary that's trying to guess which which is which, uh, will come up with the similar numbers, namely, they'll be identical as far as this algorithm is concerned. So no adversary can distinguish between them. This is an amazing, uh, you know, uh, amazingly strong definition. So, you know, it, it just says that basically everything you encrypt looks like random to, you know, to anybody looking at it without having more information about uh, the function. It's not like uh, somebody was supposed to decode it. So they're really shooting for the moon, and amazingly they, they get there. I mean, uh, they'll soon say it. But I want to say that this definition is so powerful. First of all, it's the first mathematical definition of what a secret is. And moreover, you know, you just look at it and you realize that no deterministic function would ever do. I mean, deterministic function, if you had these two messages, zero and one, you'll try applying it to zero, you'll try applying it to one, and you'll see what it was. So it already says that encryption must be probabilistic. It's a very powerful message. Uh, uh, what they also do, which of course complements this definition, is showing that this is not just a good definition, it's possible to achieve it based on you know, clear, precise mathematical hardness assumption. For example, the, the assumption that factoring integers is difficult. Okay? And yeah, uh, this set up the mathematical theory of cryptography and all the, you know, uh, internet security, shopping online, everything that you uh, use. Uh, so here's the list of, I mean, it changed cryptography from studying just, you know, encryption and from doing only encryption to lots of applications, uh, you know, that we use, you know, uh, online shopping, contract signing, uh, exchanging secrets, internet elections, zero knowledge proofs, you know, blockchains, all of them. This uh, security definition underlies them all. Uh, and of course, all of them are done digitally, right, without physical implement. Uh, for each one of them, uh, we ask the same question, you know, is a given protocol, you know, just a specification of how people shopping online should behave, what messages that should exchange and so on, things that are done by your, your computers or phones, uh, but, uh, you know, they're implementing some protocols. And the same basic question is asked, what does it mean that protocol is not just encryption now, it's much more complicated uh, interactions. How do you know if it's secure? Well, it turns out that for each one of them to understand how, you know, how secure it is and what it is, what assumptions it's resting on, depends on a separate imitation game that you set up, usually comparing the leakage in this protocol to the leakage in some ideal situation where maybe you have, uh, you know, trusted parties. Like in elections, maybe you, you want to compare it to the government <laughs> protecting your secrets, if you want, <laughs> uh, to the actual implementation. Anyway, they are all based on similar setup, similar uh, imitation game. Uh, okay, we did one topic. We only see three more questions. Yeah. I'll repeat the question. Okay. The question is, encrypted messages must be decrypted. Yes. Otherwise they are worthless. And the standard way is to use a key. Oh, thank you. So encrypted messages must be decryptable. And the standard way is to use a key, and all the secrecy, according to Kirchhoff's law, should be hidden in the key. 
But other than that, the whole process should be deterministic. Right. So, so is your random math just key selection? Yeah, so it's not true what you said. It's, you don't have real. Kirchhoff's law is very well. I'm not going to get into technical details, and Peter and I will have a conversation afterwards. But uh, actually, for those of you, or you, or you in particular, know that public key encryption does not uh, need a key, right? You can, uh, you're the person, well, you, the person who generated. Uh, you know, the public key system can decrypt the messages sent to them and nobody else can, assuming hardness of factoring. So, and nevertheless, the, the, the scheme is probabilistic. So it's, uh, you know, anyway, it all works, uh, but maybe it's too detailed to, yeah, it all works. Uh, <laughs> okay, so good, but that teaches me a lesson because <laughs> If you ask a question that uh, depends on knowledge that maybe most of the audience doesn't have, maybe you can take it to the end of the <laughs> lecture. Okay, let's move to randomness. Um, so randomness, uh, Harry mentioned this, you know, is an amazing, uh, amazingly powerful tool. Uh, if you have it, uh, you know, first of all, you know, we seem to have it. I mean, it seems that nature provides us with some unpredictable phenomena. And uh, maybe purely, you know, independent coin tosses. And if we have them, then uh, we have lots of applications. Uh, I listed some sampling, scientific experiments, simulations, probabilistic algorithms, cryptography, of course, game theory, and <laughs> gambling, and many others. Uh, and the basic, uh, I'll, I'll focus on probabilistic algorithms. Uh, yeah, how it did me service to talking about them. Um, they are seemingly much faster than deterministic ones. That's at least our experience. And uh, uh, the question is, are they? I mean, uh, you know, is this power real or just imaginary? We are just too stupid to design algorithms without randomness. And it's important because it's not clear that we, you know, the unpredictable phenomena we have is really independent, you know, coin tosses, the uniform distribution. So we can consider three different worlds that we live in. I mean, I'm not sure which one we actually live in, but, uh, uh, you know, the first one is where perfect randomness is available. For example, people believe that, you know, quantum mechanics is true, so you can, uh, you get them probably from uh, measuring photons. Uh, that's one possible world. That's where we have uh, you know, everything we want. Then, uh, uh, you know, maybe the world is not so friendly. It still has some randomness, some entropy. There is, uh, you know, events that if we measure them look like they're somewhat unpredictable, like, I know, the stock market. We cannot perfectly predict, so maybe it has some entropy. Sunspots, uh, you know, radioactive. Uh, so this, they seem to uh, suggest some, you know, give us some distribution which is, uh, you know, not quite, you know, maybe bits are biased and maybe they are dependent on each other, like the weather, you know, tomorrow is more likely to be like the weather today than be totally independent from it. Uh, so that's the second world, and uh, sort of the third, which is worse, is uh, from this point of view, is the world is deterministic. There is no randomness whatsoever. You know, everything was predicted, was, uh, uh, could be predicted uh, from the start. And, um, you know, we have everything in this uh, you know, first. And the question is what happens in this uh, other case? What happens to probabilistic algorithms? Are they useless? Are they, you know, can we do something with them? So I want to talk about this briefly. And the key to understanding it is to understand which bias distributions can actually be used. Okay. And this leads to the definition of uh, pseudo-randomness. So we want to say when is the distribution of these antique coins that's not quite you know, perfect uh, is useful. Uh, so that's the definition of pseudo-randomness. And again, we subject it to our Turing test, our imitation game. Say, well, uh, a distribution looks like the uniform distribution if not, nobody can tell them apart, if no algorithm can tell them apart. So uh, we say uh, this distribution is pseudo-random if every algorithm that's supposed to say, well, it is uniform or it's not, you know, 
cannot tell them apart, although there's similar answers. So then we say that, you know, this distribution is pseudo-random. It turns out that you have this definition, and again, you can, uh, you know, not just make this definition, but actually get such distributions from, uh, for example, from hard functions or from weak sources. And then you get a theory that, uh, you know, I will not uh, explain all the terms there, but there is a, a connection between computational hardness and, uh, you know, the ability to generate pseudo-random uh, uh, you know, distributions, and this leads to you know lots of uh, practical applications in cryptography and uh, yeah, in actually quite a bit of uh, other places. And in particular, it leads to an answer to the question I asked of the previous slide. You know what happens in this uh, you know this world where you don't have perfect randomness, and it turns out you don't lose anything. It's also pretty amazing. In the second one, even if you have very you know lousy you know sort of low entropy distributions, as long as you have some entropy, you can you know implement all probabilistic algorithms. It's far from being the obvious simulation. You have to do quite a bit of work. It's an elaborate theory that was designed over two or three decades, but, uh, you know, by now we understand it completely. And, uh, you know, basically what happens is that there is a way to purify randomness and then use it in the algorithms, uh, giving you an ability to, to just, uh, you know, do everything you could in the perfect world. And the most challenging one is, the, you know, the situation that the world is deterministic. How do you run a probabilistic algorithm without any random bit? And here you have to make an assumption, as far as we know. Uh, this is an assumption that uh, you know, P is different than NP or for uh, layman. It's just that some problems, like the longest path problem that I mentioned, uh, being difficult. Some problems, you know, many of the problems we <laughs> want to solve seem to be difficult. If you have one, then that's all you need to say that, you know, you can uh, still use probabilistic algorithms. The way you, uh, you do it is uh, basically you create pseudo-random distributions from this you know, kind of pseudo-random generators. Uh, and uh, the upshot is that if you have a fast probabilistic algorithm, there is a fast deterministic one that does the same, and you know, it's actually explicit. So you lose nothing, even in this world. So this is another major theory, and uh, you know these uh, uh, you know are very elaborate. And uh, it turns out, besides uh, you know understanding uh, this uh, you know sort of surprising uh, uh, demonstration that random is actually quite weak, much weaker than we thought, it has many unexpected benefits. Constructions of, for example, fault tolerant networks and error correcting codes and things come out of this that. You know, nobody expected. Okay, that's the second and uh, yeah, question. <laughs> How you can be sure that uh, there isn't an algorithm that deceives? Uh, One moment. To make a definition. Yes. I mean, how can you be sure that uh, nobody can find a real an algorithm that distinguishes them? Yes, yeah, so this is where the, the hardness assumption comes in. If there's a hard problem and your algorithm, the algorithm trying to, you know, the probabilistic algorithms that, uh, you know, you're trying to de-randomize, remove randomness from, they cannot solve the hard problem by assumption. This is used in a sophisticated way to uh, create sort of random distributions. But it's not obvious. It's not obvious. But anyway, that's where, uh, you know, this uh, hardness assumption comes in. You don't assume it, you just say they are efficient algorithms, they cannot solve a hard problem. That's where it comes in. Yeah, thanks, that's a great question. All right, now I want to uh, move to something maybe a bit more uh, um, technical, but uh, I, I really uh, think that you know, the, this uh, study of randomness goes way beyond computation. I want to say something about structural pseudo-randomness, which uh, appears in quite a number of areas. Uh, and the setup, the example I want to give is uh, this uh, famous Ramsey theorem, uh, which the intuitive meaning of it is uh, the following quite surprising thing. Nothing can be totally chaotic. 
every large structure, large enough structure, or large enough system, sorry, has in it somewhere a piece which is very structured. You try to make it chaotic, but you know, there's always structure somewhere. So that's a you know, informal statement of Ramsey's theorem. I want to exemplify this. So uh, here's, uh, I want just to define what is a periodic sequence. I mean, it's the obvious definition. So I listed here all the integers. I mean, I didn't list all of them, I listed. <laughs> you can imagine it's going, uh, continuing. A periodic sequence is just the sequ like the top or bottom sequences, like the top one starts at seven and goes every four steps, right? Or the bottom one goes every seven. Uh, so per that's a periodic sequence, is what you think. And of course, the integers have periodic sequences in them, in fact, arbitrarily long. Why? Because, you know, in the, the integers themselves are a periodic sequence. Uh, they jump by one, so clearly they have. Yeah, but that's not the question here. The question is what happens to subsets of integers? So I give you some of the integers, not all of them. Maybe, you know, 1% of all the integers. And I ask, you know, do subsets of integers have, you know, long periodic sequences in them? Long, you know, here's the question. So these, these of course, were not good. Uh, which subsets uh, of integers contain long periodic sequences? And here's an amazing uh, result. I mean, it's really mind-boggling, you know, even if you know the, the proof. Uh, it's by Semeredi, uh, seven, from 75, it's, uh, you know, this question was open for decades. And, uh, you know, this is one of the most important and uh, useful theorems in all of combinatorics. He proved that all dense subsets of integers have this property, all of them. If you take 1% of the integers or 1 millionth of all the integers in any way you want, and you are trying to make it chaotic, it will have periodic substructures of length, whatever you want, a thousand, a million, a trillion, it will have it. It's an amazing uh, uh, result. And then you can even ask, you know, you go farther and ask, what about su subsets of the integers that are sparser, that are not as dense as, you know, like, for example, the primes? Do the primes have, you know, periodic sequences? That looks a bit far-fetched because, they, you know, they seem to be multiplicatively ordered. But, uh, you know, just uh, 15 years ago, this was proved as well. So what's going on, or how is it proved, and what does it have to do with randomness? So here's, a, you know, the main thing, is that one easy fact is that if you pick these subsets of integers at random, they will have lo large periodic subsequences. It's a simple uh, thing. So what? I mean, we don't care about random sequences. We care about arbitrary, uh, random subsets. We care about arbitrary ones. And the key thing to say, uh, key insight to uh, summarize this result, you ask, well, which subsets look random? And his answer, well, it's, his answer is not about subsets of integers. It's about networks. And he connects the two. But he says that if you look at networks, then every networks dense enough, like uh, dense subsets, every network looks random. And from this, he concludes that also every subset of integers looks random, which is, an, again, a strange uh, you know, uh, statement, and I want to explain how it's done. So I want to explain this thing about dense networks. Um, so let me explain what networks are and what are communities and books. Bond. So a network, you know what it is. I mean, it's, it can be, uh, represent the system of roads or internet connections or Facebook connections. Uh, just dots connected by some uh, edges, some pairwise co uh, connections. Pairs, some pairs are related, some are not. That's a network. Uh, what is a cluster or a community? It's just a subset, okay? Any subset. And what is a bond? Well, if you have two communities, you may try to see how bonded are they. What is the fraction of edges? So the bond between a pair of communities is just, what is the fraction of connections they have between them out of all possible connections that they could have, okay? So it's a number between zero and one. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a bond. Now, what's the 
you know, what does Semmelady tell us, tell us about bonds? First of all, he makes a definition of the style of the imitation game, saying, when are two networks similar? And now you see the type of tests in this Turing test are different. You just compare, you know, to say that, you know, they are indistinguishable, you just subject them to tests which compute the bonds between a pair of communities. You say that two networks are the same, are identical, or bond similar, if whatever two communities you look at, and you look at the bond between them, you get roughly the same number. So very different types of tests than before, structural. So, for example, you know, if you do it to this, you get similar numbers. To any pair you do it, you get similar numbers. Oops, yeah, okay. So that's the definition, that is the, the basis of the, you know, what we'll see next. And now you want to say, in what sense does every network look like a random network? So I hope this will be clear, but that's a famous similar irregularity lemma, that every network is bond similar to a random network. And uh, his proof basically uh, shows that you know, there's a tiny model for what a random network is, uh, which comes from the following, you know, uh, you know, amazing thing. It says that take any network like this N0 and just check the bonds between few communities, very few communities. These numbers, these small numbers, this tiny model, or is it? Yeah, it just, <coughs> let's say you take three communities cleverly, cleverly, uh, you partition to three sets, like red, green, and blue, and you just measure the bonds between red and red, red and blue, and so on. Write down these number, numbers. This will determine a random model that this network will look like, will look identical to. So how do you, uh, you know, so here is a, just to see how this uh, random network looks like. I mean, you pick you know, the points just like before, and then you toss coins according to the probabilities mentioned there. So this is a random network, and it turns out that almost surely it will be bond similar to your original network. So it all starts from you know, an imitation game. Once you have this uh, you know, uh, theorem, you can uh, prove this result about networks. You can import it to uh, sequences, but you can do, in fact, much more. Uh, we looked at networks and sequences, but in fact, this kind of statement turns out to be true for essentially any structure and essentially for any type of test. It's extremely powerful. And because of that, uh, you know, well, it grew up of, uh, you know, sort of parallel tracks of research in computer science and in mathematics, which is really nice how they converge and, uh, you know, uh, interacted. And uh, today we understand using this, uh, you know, just sort of type of dichotomy between structure and randomness, that's extremely useful to proving theorems. It's like a methodology for proving theorems in lots of areas of mathematics. So I'm not going to elaborate on how, but this is uh, absolutely key. Uh, good, we are done with the third one. Questions about this? Good, yeah, I have 10 minutes, okay. Uh, questions about this uh, story? Yeah. Can, can you say a bit more about One how moment. you would uh, pick those three sets, for example? Like yes, so, uh, yeah, so the question was uh, how are these three sets or ten sets, uh, a small number of clusters being picked? It's, uh, uh, it's unbelievable, in fact. I mean, his idea is the following. You know, start with any partition to three sets. And then you say, well, uh, is it good for all other clusters or it's not? And uh, you're up to some, you know, you want to measure everything up to bond similarity of epsilon, I don't know, whatever. Say, so is this partition good or not? Uh, well, if it's uh, good, then I'm done. If not, you know, uh, there's some, there must be something, you know, it's a pair of clusters which is, for which it's not good. Let me use them to refine my partition a bit, okay? And, uh, okay, and then you refine it, you have a new partition. Is it good? Okay, so it seems like this kind of process can go on forever because the networks, you know, they are arbitrarily large. They may have a billion, trillion, or, yeah. but it shows, no, 
it will converge after a finite number of steps. You know, you'll get, oops, you'll get a, you know, a partition just like this. Yeah, that's the proof. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, absolutely fundamental and important. Okay, so let me go to, yeah, somehow I don't know if I'm, yeah, the microphone works, yeah, okay. Uh, the last topic. So the last topic is, uh, again, something very dear to everybody, like uh, I think uh, yeah, randomness is sort of everybody uh, feels they know something about it, and uh, I think privacy, everybody thinks they want more of it, um, especially in this world. Uh, so I want to talk about just the issue that, uh, you know, the privacy comes out from the problem and then explain a central definition in the same style uh, of imitation game that led to use progress and that's the most recent advance of all the ones I was talking about. So really privacy is a problem only if you also want some utility. I mean, if you don't want utility, if you hide all the information from everybody, then there is no privacy problem. So, so imagine a database, it can, you know, many individual records like your records, it can be, you know, I don't know, census information uh, or medical data. And uh, whenever you have data, you know, you have uh, what do you have? <laughs> yeah, you have data analysis. I mean, you want to analyze the data to uh, you want to interrogate your data to uh, learn something that's useful for uh, your society. Uh, for example, um, you know, that's the utility part, right? I mean, uh, you know, maybe you want to study some societal issues, welfare gaps, you know, where do you want to build roads and so on and so forth. Or if it's medical, maybe you want to design better drugs, better treatments for various illnesses and so on. So that's the utility part. And of course, the uh, privacy part co contrasts with it when, you know, somebody, I don't know, maybe uh, some person in this database, Jane Doe, uh, you know, wants to know, uh, should I participate in this study? Or maybe should I tell the truth when they ask me questions? Right? It's a serious question. Of course, she would like, like everybody would like, their, uh, you know, private information not to be leaked by the analysis that is done and the results that are published, right? So, of course, this is a very old problem. It was, you know, from the 60s where computers and data storage were available. It, uh, you know, became an, a serious issue and there were studies. And there were various, you know, solutions were suggested, restricting the number of queries, you know, filtering the answers in a way that may maybe add noise to uh, some questions so that, uh, uh, you know, they somehow, dis uh, you know, uh, erase, may erase some of the individual information. And the question is, uh, you know, the, yeah, for example, you know, these analysts don't communicate directly to the uh, data. They, what they query the data, maybe they want the average salary of anybody between the age of 30 and 50 in Amsterdam. So they don't get the exact answer because many of these queries will then get individual uh, data, but they get some noisy version of the answer, whatever this means. And the question, uh, I mean, so this idea existed for decades, but a good definition of what is a good filter didn't exist. And uh, here's a definition that came up just uh, uh, 15 years ago or so, and uh, that, you know, the, what's called today uh, differential privacy in this paper. And the idea is the differential means for, you know, differentiating one person. Uh, it's supposed to have individual privacy. So when is a filter good? You want to distinguish the following two worlds, one in which Jane Doe is part of the database and one in which it's not. And otherwise, the databases are identical. And uh, if you want that, you know, they're indistinguishable, well, you, you know already how to do an imitation game yourself, right? Uh, you say, I see, okay. 
Yeah, if you, you're subjected to a query, the answer to the query looks essentially the same, whether Jane Doe is part of it or not. And you define a filter, a noise mechanism, to be differentially private if, regardless of what the two databases are, uh, regardless of which database you use, you just change them uh, by adding or removing any particular record, so they are adjacent uh, databases, D0 and D1, and for every legal query you, are, you allow, these two numbers are the same. Then, you know, I think Jane Doe should be happy, or anybody should be happy. And uh, it allows, uh, let me go, not go into this, it allows a big theory to be built around it that, uh, um, you know, allows you to study many queries, many different queries, allows to improve the precision accuracy to ask, you know. Uh, but, you know, another, you know, thing that it allows is uh, this post-knowledge kind of thing. I mean, if a year later Jane Doe publishes something on a website with personal, you cannot cross, you know, cross-reference and use it together with the results of this study uh, to gain more information of her. It's the definition guarantees it for free. And uh, the practical impact of this in a very short time was quite amazing because uh, various different entities started using, uh, you know, releasing data according to um, differential privacy mechanisms. Uh, one is the United States government that's releasing data from the most recent census uh, using it. And also lots of companies which, hold, which have, as you, I'm sure you know, lots of data about you lots and lots of data about you. They are releasing it to various studies uh, using uh, you know, differential privacy. So it had uh, quite an impact, but I want my last slide to tell you about an impact of this definition that was totally unexpected. Uh, and it has to do actually with the, you know, the scientific method itself, the way we yeah, do science. So let me explain this. So this came up in these uh, two recent papers, like five years ago. Um, and uh, let me start with the problem and then with the solution. Uh, okay, this is a cycle of life of science. <laughs> um, you know, you have uh, data, you have uh, you know, scientists or machine learning programs trying to understand something. Uh, and uh, the cycle is, you know, is being repeated again and again. You, you, Query the data, you get some answers, you maybe tune your parameters, the, you know, the model, uh, you form some uh, maybe new hypotheses, you generate new queries, and, you know, it comes back and you do it again and you do it again. So that's how the, you know, yeah, science has been done for centuries. In fact, we benefited from it quite, quite a bit. So what's the problem? Well, the problem, uh, at least the way it's, uh, it seems in the you know, last decade, you see more and more articles. Uh, this is just one that's extremely well cited. It has uh, 10 or 20,000 citations, but there are many of them. And they all have crisis in, a in big letters and big colors. And the title of this particular one is Why Most Published Research Findings Are Wrong. Right? This should bother you if it's true. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, so why, why, uh, you know, why is it even claimed? What's the problem? I mean, we've been doing this for, you know, centuries, right? Uh, here's the reason. First of all, first observation is the data is expensive. Okay, because data is expensive, it's being used again and again, and adaptively so. And because it's used again and again, this model, uh, you know, this uh, tuning your model uh, becomes, you know, uh, overfitted to the data you have because you are using often because the data is expensive. You are using the same data, and 
then you cannot generalize the results you have about the data to the world, right? I mean, we don't care really about the data. The data represents a sample from some, you know, nature or maybe society, you know, we want to understand diseases or natural phenomena, and we just have this data, and that's what we want to understand, a universal natural law or, you know, how to design a drug for all people and not just for the ones you already seen. So, uh, that's a problem. So what can you do about it? I mean, data remains expensive, and uh, you know, what, what do you do about it? So here's an amazing observation. Suppose we let the scientists or the learning program interact with the data according to a differentially private mechanism. This seems, you know, sort of ridiculous because we don't care. I mean, this story, let's say we don't care about privacy. Privacy is not an issue. Maybe it's the data is about, uh, you know, bees in, uh, you know, why are bees, uh, you know, disappearing. Uh, we don't care about, uh, but nevertheless, we are applying a differential private uh, mechanism like I showed in the previous slide. Uh, it's still, you know, utility is there. That's what was demonstrated by this definition. Uh, and the theorem in these papers is uh, basically that if you apply this differentially private mechanism, then this prevents overfitting. So some of the property that you know, was used for privacy can be used to say that it prevents, if despite the adaptiveness, prevents overfitting, ensures statistical validity and generalization to the real phenomena. Uh, yeah, despite this sort of seeming problem. So it's an amazing, I find this sort of consequence quite, quite amazing. I don't know how widespread are, you know, is it going to be that, uh, you know, uh, the use of this, but uh, yeah, theoretically it uh, you know, seems to go around this problem. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, yeah, the principle of Turing and then in all these works is that things are identical unless, you know, you can tell them apart. Uh, it's true not just for these examples, it's true about diamonds, it's true about Picasso, it's true about news, you know. <laughs> Whether they're fake or real is just up to the, you know, the tools you have. Um, you, of course, you know, the type of tests that are applied depends on the you know, situation at hand and what's physically and, uh, you know, uh, information theoretically and computationally available. Uh, the message is that this behavioral type of uh, you know, tests, the subjective definitions, like imitation games, can be used, you know, in far more uh, situations. I mentioned some in the beginning, and I think it's a, basically a fundamental paradigm. Uh, more generally, uh, you know, it talks mainly about applications or, uh, you know, fields within the theory of computation and computational complexity. Uh, um, I think that uh, you know, it's part of mathematics, the theory of computation, the mathematical area, but I think it uh, uh, has a larger focus on, uh, on definitions, on modeling. Uh, it's not just about proving theorems. Of course, lots of mathematical fields start with good definitions. And, uh, anyway, I think we do a lot of uh, modeling and uh, uh, trying to understand the power and the uh, you know, resources used in various processes. And then, you know, making these definitions is, uh, like I said in the beginning, it's primary. And then, you know, theorems and theories and so on follow, and this uh, affects, uh, you know, math, science, technology, and society. Uh, okay, let me end with my favorite last slide. Uh, for those of you who want to <laughs> read more about computational complexity, this was written as an invitation to the field. Just came out two years ago. If you like the cover I designed, uh, then you should buy it. But if you don't care for the cover, it's free uh, online uh, you know, on my website. So you don't have to buy anything. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Avi, for deep thoughts, big challenges, and it affects uh, us all. Uh, questions? Yeah. Could you wait for the microphone? Yeah. I always get stressed when I have to use a microphone, but uh, 
Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for this presentation. It's very amazing to get like this global view of the whole area. Amazing, thanks a lot. Uh, I was wondering, so about a result that you mentioned uh, about algorithms that uh, for every randomized algorithm you can find a deterministic one that is equally good and it's also exp you can also construct it. Yeah. And you mentioned that this somehow throws randomness from its throne, that maybe it's not such a strong concept as we thought, but I understand this from a philosophical perspective, like of randomness, what is it, how important is it, but what are like concrete implications of this result about how we work with algorithms? Let's say, does this affect like the way that we construct algorithms, how we should work with algorithms? Um, does it affect, let's say, the way that computer scientists work with complexity? What is... Yeah, there are many, uh, so I can give a very long answer to this question. It's a great question. Uh, it affects uh, both theoretical and practical uh, work of computer scientists, of uh, you know, cryptographers, and so on. So uh, some of the, the, the impacts are uh, practical. I mean, often if you don't trust your whatever pseudo-random generator or whatever you take or randomness, you know, that you use to, uh, to run probabilistic algorithms, and every, you know, computer uses some, something, uh, then you can uh, 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 use some of these sort of extractors, what I call that purifying randomness, that we will clean them and be make them, like, uh, perfect. Uh, you use this in cryptography to uh, ensure that, uh, you know, your adversaries cannot predict your random bit, so these are uh, also used, and uh, uh, many, I, I mentioned this, uh, the theories themselves, I mean, the, the type of objects you, you uh, generate in order to prove these theorems, uh, actually, you know, sort of, in, in maybe uh, unexpectedly, but uh, in some sense, it's sort of essential, they generate for you objects that are uh, extremely useful for other purposes. So I mentioned error correcting codes. They come up of, from constructions like this. Um, uh, networks that are fault tolerant, and uh, you know many other uh, objects. It's also essential for complexity theory itself and its uh, and its progress. But maybe I will, yeah uh, okay. stop here. Thank you. Thanks. I propose that we go on to the second part of the evening. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, Avi. Thank you. So, Alex, may I invite you to introduce the work of uh, Aslo. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> the slides should come. Yeah. Ah, it's coming, yes. It's the last of all of us, well, I would call, uh, as m most people, all people maybe, Lotzi Lovas. I don't know, is Avi your full name, Avi? Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> yes or no? Uh, yes or no, okay. Uh, so uh, if I say Lotzi, I mean Laszlo Lovas, of course. So let us see. The history goes back to 1965. It's the year when Avi was born, I understood, from uh, Harry's talk. That was the first publication of uh, Lutzi, 1965, when he was 17 years old. Let me figure out again. Yeah, here it is. Probably you can understand it, but I give the <laughs> translation. Grass containing no disjoint circuits. This is the picture out of it. It gives a uh, classification of all possible graphs that don't contain two disjoint circuits. Uh, in a sense, in a certain sense, those are all. I mean, you can hang some trees on it, or you can put points on the edges, and the, the middle two are series, infinite series. But uh, that was classified there, and that was a very early paper, 1965, and Lutzi was uh, 47. It was followed by many other results, pioneering results. Here, let me see, yeah, yeah. 1972, the perfect graph theorem, 1977, LOFAS, local lemma, referred to often like LLL, it's coming back, 
the turning in LL, but later. In 1978, Canasius conjecture, a very uh, nice conjecture. And uh, 1979, the Shannon capacity bound. And what is uh, 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 amazing is that for every of the methods, every of the theorems, a different method is used. Or at least for the perfect graph theorem, the, the, it is at the root of polyhedral methods, quite geometric. The lowest local lemma is a probabilistic statement. Knezer conjecture was proved with topology. And the Shannon capacity bound was a very surprising method using eigenvalues. Actually, the first and the fourth, yeah, the perfect graph theorem and the Shannon capacity bound were, in a sense, uh, rooted in a paper by Shannon, 1956. I think that's the year I was born, Harvey, or was it 65? Yeah, oh, yeah sorry. Uh, le let me expand a little bit on, uh, on this, this bound. All circuits play an important role there. And for instance, this five circuit, it's an odd circuit with an odd number of vertices. And uh, it's about alphabets, and this alphabet has only five letters you put there. And the line between two letters means that you can uh, confuse the two letters. There is a way, say, of writing F and P, where you can't distinguish between is it an F or a P. And uh, that is what uh, a line means. But E and P is the idea you cannot confuse them. Well, if you use an, uh, only words using E and P, it's, you can always uh, find out what is the, the real world uh, uh, word. So, if, say, if you take uh, uh, words of length two, you can take EE, EP, PE, and PP. And if, say, the first E, would, or, uh, an E would not be written as an E very properly, but it might be an F, then you can still recover what is the original word. So if you only use words like this, you, uh, well, you can, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's error correcting. Error, uh, yeah, correcting and detecting actually. But you can do better with those five words, five words of length two. There is some, some I should probably go away here. Uh, namely those, and uh, what does it mean, say, if you have this uh, word? Uh, I don't know what it means, the word, but uh, it is a word. And uh, the first letter, you don't know whether it's a B or an R. The second letter, you don't know whether it's an F or a P. Uh, so. What, what would be the word in the alphabet, in, the, in, in, in your dictionary, say, uh, which it should be? Anybody as a, as a, as a guess? RF. RF, yes. That's the only word, uh, so RF is the only word that fits. Uh, BF is not in it, or, or RP, or uh, I'm missing a, a further. Uh, uh, this is the only only uh, word which uh, allows. Uh, that's the meaning, actually. And now you might think, well, make even more uh, word lengths. Instead of two, you make word lengths two, uh, three, or four. And you can, of course, if you use all uh, uh, pairs of words of lengths two, you can make a, 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 a dictionary with, with, uh, of lengths four. Uh, with the same properties, actually. But you cannot do better. You cannot make 26, for instance. Uh, you can make 5 squared of length 4 by using this, this dictionary. But f uh, more, more than uh, 25, you cannot do. And who, uh, what does it mean in mathematically? Actually, that uh, the, the, the Shannon capacity is square root of 5, which means that the, the information rate pro letter is uh, you have to take the, the square root, of course, because yeah, you use uh, length two. And if you uh, consider length three, you take a third root, and so on. But, uh, uh, well, th this is the, the theorem which proves that uh, actually the general capacity of C5 is uh, square root of five. And uh, th this, this sign of the theta means the, 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 there's a bound on the general capacity. I was lucky receiving one of the first prints of the paper, which was done by carbon paper, maybe some of the older P 
people know what that means. This is black paper, you put it to leaves. I don't know which copy it was, maybe the fifth or the sec sixth, you know, let's see how many copies you made. Uh, here you see the uh, definition of this Shannon capacity actually, and uh, I think all the signs were written down by Lutz's wife, Kathy. No? Oh, I, uh, I, because uh, uh, you, you see it was not only with carbon, but it is also cut, uh, uh, cut, cut and paste, early form, you see, you see a line there, this is pasted together, two sheets, apparently there was something wrong behind there, and uh, you can, uh, so this is the back of the paper, you see uh, <laughs> the, the, the white, uh, uh, white tape here, and here also, and there, and uh, it, uh, probably all the copies uh, have the same phenomenon. So, uh, and actually what was also interesting, I mean, you see that the theta, and probably you might have learned on school to write the theta, I don't know, who, write, who have learned it and remember uh, to write it like this, eh? like, uh, uh, it is the, this, the first theta in tech, and you have also the theta in tech. And somehow the first one is much easier to write. And uh, well, some of you has written a hundred times probably this theta in the paper, and then there are all, another ten copies, so it is close to thousand maybe. Uh, so I was wondering whether Donald Knuth will make tech. Uh, uh, sorry, I have to understand. Uh, uh, whether he has put at defined this far theta, especially because of the introduction of theta, the theta bound by Lotzi. So, uh, well, uh, what did he answer? What did he say? This would be a great story if true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> However, I didn't really learn about the Lovers theta function until I read Grote Lovers Schrijver in 1991. Far theta invented the tech in 19, 1982 or earlier. Well, that is. That is still after the uh, 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 78 paper, so it could have been. <laughs> but, uh, of course, I did enjoy every moment when I wrote notes on the century theorem in 1991, because it was such fun to use fast heater. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's nice. Okay, I'll go back to my list uh, here. Uh, well, I don't list all the pioneering results of Lutzi, but let me mention a few with. Uh, give a Dutch connection. So in 1981, uh, the Alpset method in, was applied in combinatorial optimization. And in 1982, the LLL algorithm, uh, another LLL, L cubed. And again, this is based on, uh, on, a, on a different, uh, uh, both algorithms are based on a, a, a geometric way. It's algorithmic geometric, and the first one uh, we did with Martin Kreutzel, and the second one is with uh, Arjen and Hendrik Lensra. Hendrik is here, yeah. So, Arjen is not here, so I didn't see Arjen, but... Now it goes on like that, and uh, let me finish uh, uh, this list with the 2000s, uh, 2000s when Lotzi introduced the idea of graph limits. In the talk, uh, it will uh, occur uh, quite a lot, I think, and this is more analytic, measure theoretic. Uh, so it, it is interesting to see that so many different methods and always uh, surprising new connections were made. Uh, that was the pioneering, actually, the, the, uh, that, uh, between different uh, mathematics and combinatorial or algorithmic problems. So the, that is really a, a fantastic uh, list. But let me finish with mentioning a few other items on uh, the impressive curriculum vitae of Lazzi. Uh, no, I should do it like this. Oh, yeah. Of course. Well, I put him in al alphabetic order. Here, starting with Abel, of course. But the uh, other part is Lazzi was president of the IMU, the International Mathematical Union, and also president of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences for six years. No easy jobs. And again, back to the Dutch connection. 
de Brau uh, Rotsi Korte Brouwer Medal in 1993 van de Koninklijk Wiskundig Genootschap. En finally, to mention, is Rotsi is a foreign member of the KNW since 2006. So a good moment in the KNW to give the floor to Rotsi. <laughs> Computer here, so. <laughs> I, I don't know. You can have no, mine, mine works. Okay. Is there a? Yeah, this, works. This, this is connected <laughs> to my. You, you, you. To your own computer. Yeah. If you want to try, you, you may, but it doesn't go on anymore. This is the last slide. Uh, so how can I start my? Uh, oh, there is another one here. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, uh, I would like to talk about this thing that uh, Lex mentioned uh, among the last, uh, his last sentences about graph limits. And I would like to also uh, answer the question: what, what what is what are they good for? What why do you do this? So let me first start with the remark that uh, in there is a certain paradigm change or or a shift in modern science, and that's the use of networks. So uh, there is a, the, the dichotomy between discrete and continuous goes back to the Greeks, to Xenon's para paradoxes and so on. But uh, somehow it seemed that the continuous was winning. I mean, uh, all classical physics is done by uh, differential and integral computation. And so uh, and this is a calculus is a basic sub uh, subject in, in every curriculum. Uh, but recently, it turned out that there is another important element, and it's a network. Now, a network consists of discrete elements, which are well identifiable, but they are kind of interconnected in some ways. Uh, and this interconnection pattern is a graph. It's described by a graph. I think how we call them networks, but uh, uh, they are almost interchangeably called graphs. So it consists of certain elements and connections between them. Uh, and there are many, many uh, of these uh, networks. And I am interested now when the networks are very large. Uh, uh, internet or uh, social networks. And uh, by social network, I, I not only mean that, uh, that uh, the um, Facebook and these kind of things, but also the whole society is a huge network of individuals. Uh, history is played on this network, and the spread of religions, of uh, inventions, of uh, diseases, uh, all goes on on this network of individuals. And uh, this was sort of like a generic text, text I used to in, uh, introduce that, well, networks may also be interesting for social scientists, not only for graph theorists or mathematicians. But uh, the last word here, I mean diseases, that really is uh, over the last uh, two or three years has become really extremely in focus. And uh, we understood that the properties of these networks are very important in understanding and probably limiting the spread of, of, uh, of a pandemic. Ecological networks, chips, uh, a crystal is a network of atoms. Uh, the human brain is, is, a, is of course, a, a very much studied 
very complex and very interesting and very important network of, of uh, brain cells. And in a sense, the whole universe is a network of elementary particles which sometimes interact. And uh, that is, of course, uh, the largest network at this time which we can uh, imagine. So, so there are lots of large networks in real life. Now, the question is, what can mathematics contribute? So, we, uh, so far in most scientists, this is a language. So we use a network to describe uh, uh, in pictures, often, say, the ecology of a, of a forest or the interactions between various uh, living creatures in the forest. But uh, can mathematics go beyond that and, and, and provide some, some help? To, to these sciences. And if you begin to think about it, then you will realize that large networks, and now I am thinking of really large networks, say billions of nodes, they represent a number of entirely new challenges. Uh, so here I listed some of them. It's not even clear what properties of a network you can study. Uh, I, I used to I mean, one, one of my favorite examples is uh, the question whether the internet has an even or an odd number of nodes. For small graphs, that's a crucial question. I mean, uh, small graphs with an even number of nodes differ quite a bit from, I mean, there are several theorems where, where the number or parity of the number of nodes is important. Obviously, for the internet, this, is, this doesn't even make sense because we don't, we don't ever have the internet, uh, all nodes and all connections. So we would just like to get some global question, type of questions. Um, how to obtain information about these large networks? Um, I will talk about this uh, later in defining the, uh, the uh, notion of a graph limit. But uh, let me s just point out that, again, recently, uh, we have heard a lot about this. So you can uh, say the social network on which the, an epidemic is spreading. Uh, there are really two kinds of information that you are trying to get about it. So people studying uh, this, this issue, they do sort of local information. Uh, if, if somebody is ill, you try to discover the connections uh, to a certain depth, to a certain distance from the person. And uh, so there is a contact search, which is a local type of information. And then there is, uh, there is also global information which people are trying to get. I happen to work with some people who are, who are doing this kind of research. For example, they try to find how much commutation is going on between two large cities. So it's a global information which they try to get from a number of sources, uh, from, uh, from the train company, from uh, mobile phones, uh, from uh, labor data, and, and, and a number of others. So, so to obtain information, uh, it's, uh, there are various ways of obtaining information, and usually there is uh, some kind of rather well, um, somewhat well uh, distinguishable uh, version where of uh, obtaining local data and global data. How to model them, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, clear that it's important if you want to experiment, for example, with algorithms that run on the internet, then you would like to uh, somehow, you cannot really run them on the real internet, so you would like to get some model that uh, mimics the most important properties of the internet. How to measure the similarity of two, two uh, networks, um, that's a little bit Avi already talked about this. If you have a, a, a kit of tests that you can run, and two networks cannot be distinguished by these 
these experiments, then they are similar. They are, and you can define the distance between them on how, how many of these tests you have to perform in order to distinguish them. How to run algorithms on these networks? So, so th these networks are huge, uh, billions of nodes. So even a simple algorithm uh, would probably not uh, work like a, uh, n squared or the n squared algorithm would be hopeless to run. And even how to return the result of an algorithm. So suppose you have an algorithm that tries to find a partition of the network into two parts so that the number of edges going across is maximized. That's for some reason, this is an important question in, in, in many applications called the max cut problem. Uh, Okay, so suppose, so how, how do you tell the result? You, you, you don't want to list all, all, set, all, all uh, nodes that come on the right and on the left because it would be a, 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 a probably a, a list which would be too large. So, so even to result, so this is, so these are all the questions which we would like to answer. Now I will not be able to talk uh, uh, about too much, but, uh, I will talk about the question of approximating them, which is related to modeling, but uh, it's a little bit more general. So uh, how to obtain information? Uh, okay, I already told this, so you have contact search and, uh, sorry, I, I uh, should have gone forward with the, this. So I just just a figure showing how information say about uh, commutation between various Hungarian uh, uh, locations and towns uh, can be obtained. Now, what is a limit theory? This is a classical saying. I don't know who. I don't really know who first said that, but it's in in uh, many differential uh, equation books and, and uh, which says that most fundamental laws of nature can be formulated as differential equations. Um, let me quote another saying. Again, I am not sure who, who, whom does it, uh, at whom should I attribute it to. And that says that the continuous is an approximation of the very large discrete. So that uh, tells you why most fundamental laws are formulated as different by differential equations. The word is discrete, but we approximate it by a very large, uh, uh, is very large discrete, we approximate it by continuous. So let me give you a particular example for this. So let's look at a piece of iron. It's, uh, it's a network of atoms, a huge, huge net, uh, network of atoms. And now suppose you want to see whether, uh, uh, if it's used in the construction of a bridge, whether the bridge would, be, would, would not collapse. Obviously, you could, in principle, write up all the locations of the nodes of the atoms and use all the connections or, uh, between the atoms and uh, compute how it behaves under you know, pressure or something. But uh, compute for, uh, so you introduce a variable for the location of every, uh, it, it, obviously hopeless thing to do, um, impossible to do this computation. But, uh, but that's not what an engineer does. An engineer thinks that this is a continuous material and then there are a small number of functions defined on this continuous material, continuous functions, pressure, temperature, I don't know, whatever, uh, uh, stress. And uh, there are differential equations which connect these quantities, and then he can solve the differential equations. So he approximates the very large discrete by continuous, and that helps to solve this problem. So what is a limit theory for graphs? You have a sequence of graphs which 
which are more and more similar as, as you go, go up. And they are larger and larger, say. So this means, as I told you, similar means, uh, following Avi's uh, presentation, it means that they are less and less distinguishable by some well-defined uh, statistics or some well-defined tests. And, uh, and then we would like to ask, OK, that's fine. So take a very large member of this sequence. Can you somehow describe it globally? Is, is there a template for that? Is there some, some kind of simplified description of it, but which would still have the same properties? Um, at this point, I should refer to the regularity lemma that uh, uh, Avi summary this result that Avi uh, uh, used as an example of the application of the general principle. It turns out that 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 provides such a template for for very large members in under certain situations. But let's look at some really simple examples. So there is a sequence of complete graphs. Obviously, they become more and more similar. Any two nodes are connected. And if there are a billion nodes and any two are connected, it's still a very boring structure. And there is really not much information contained in it. Similarly, you can look at uh, cycles or polygons, longer and longer polygons. Uh, they, they also seem to become more and more similar. Uh, come back to this. Or you can look at larger and larger pieces of a grid. Uh, obviously, become more and more similar. Or you can look at hypercubes, high and higher dimensional cubes. Don't worry if you are not familiar with the notion of a hypercube. Let me show you a, an interesting example. This is a Penrose styling. Uh, Penrose styling is, uh, there are several ways of defining this. I'm uh, here using two rhombi, uh, one with uh, 36 degrees, one with 72 degrees. Uh, and uh, you, you, it turns out you can tie the whole plane with these two rhombi. Of course, you can tie the plane just with one in a trivial way, but that, let's exclude this so there is some rule of which edge can go on which edge, which will exclude the trivial tiling. It's still true that you can tile the whole plane with these, and it's, it's a wonderful fact that you cannot tile it in any trivial, that means periodic way. So, so the, 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 the whole plane can be tiled, and there are many ways of tiling a plane with these. So larger and larger pieces of the plane tiled by, uh, by the Penrose tiles, uh, they also seem to look more and more similar. Um, uh, OK, so what should be the limit object of, of, for complete graphs? Uh, first guess is that a countable complete graph. Now, there is one trouble with this, and at this moment, I ha that, that's a really absolutely technical issue, but it, 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 it's crucial, uh, because what we want is to be able to pick to sample, so to pick a random point. And we would like to make a statistics of how, this random, how the world looks from this random point. Now, on a, uh, uh, and there is this sad fact of so it has to be uniformly picked random point. And there is this sad fact of probability theory that there is no way to pick a random element from a countable set. So what's the trick? You have to go up to, to uh, uh, an uncountable set, say, to the 0, 1 interval, and then you can pick a random point. Uh, and that turns out to be a, an important uh, Effect. So the, the limit will be a, a set on, on a 
uh, on the zero one interval, say, or it could be any other probability space. And then uh, you connect any two points by an edge. What about cycles? Well, the first guess would be that the limit is a cycle itself. I mean, geometrically, that's what the limit is. But here the problem is that somehow nodes and edges disappeared. There's, there's, they don't come there. So, uh, but you would like to keep that it's a, it has nodes and edges. So here is uh, the trick. You take a, an irrational number alpha and uh, take a circle with unit uh, circumference, and then you put in all, all chords with length alpha. And uh, this is a graph. Its connected components are two-way infinite paths. So it's a, 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 that will be a, a, a limit object for the cycles. It will be a good representation for that. So if you look at any point in this, it will have degree two, just like so two edges going out of it, just like in this sequence of cycles. Uh, what about the grids, larger and larger grids? Now, if you do, if you ask uh, your audience, then there will be two answers for this. One answer would be that it it will, if you scale them back to to the unit square, then the limit object will be a full unit square. And that's indeed a, a valid, uh, interesting, very interesting uh, limit object, and that's used a lot in statistical physics. It's the uh, scale, I mean, this uh, grid is like a crystal, and uh, this is the scaling limit. But again, nodes and edges disappeared. Uh, now there's another one. You can still add edges, or actually uh, use edges. Um, you, you have to identify the opposite edges, or make, make a torus, and then uh, uh, connect, uh, two, pick two irrational numbers, alpha and beta, and then connect horizontally any pair at distance beta, and uh, vertically any pair at distance alpha, and that is, uh, then, then uh, if you look at a particular point, then locally it will look exactly like the, the infinite grid. It will be an infinite grid. Hypercubes are, you can figure it out, but it, it, it's quite, uh, quite tricky to figure out what, what's the limit of them. But I would like to show you the, the limit of Penrose tilings. That's, that's really a lovely fact. And it's, uh, it's a lovely fact, first of all, because it was uh, the Brown, whom I had the honor to meet and, uh, when I was very young. Uh, he gave a classification of all Penrose tilings. So uh, his, his work made us understood what Penrose tilings are. And, he, and, uh, and based on that, uh, 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 Mihai Baras, uh, it's a young Hungarian uh, mathematician figured out what the limit object should be. And the way it goes is that you take a classical uh, polyhedron called the rhombic icosahedron. Uh, and the rhombic icosahedron has uh, um, 22 vertices or whatever. And uh, what you do is you you put, uh, stand it on one of its vertices, and then and then you slice it through all the other vertices, and you will get four uh, regular pentagons. And these, the union of these will be all the nodes of the limit or the vertices of the limit, and you connect two of them if the edge connecting them is parallel to one of the um, uh, one of the edges going out of the of the say the top vertex and uh, the funny thing is that this graph if you pick up a random point of it then the connected component of the random point will be a Penrose styling Every Penrose tiling will be obtained this way in, in exactly one way. So 
So this is really a fantastic uh, roundup of all the Penrose tidings. So there are interesting limit objects. That's uh, it's not, not just the trivial ones I, I was, or almost trivial ones I was shown. Now to, to, to give a little bit more, uh, speak a little bit more about this, I, introduce, I need to introduce some kind of visualization of graphs. So this is a traditional visualization of a graph. This is not uh, really that uh, informative once you have 20 or 30 nodes, you, will, you, you won't see anything. Uh, then there is a traditional encoding of the graph, which is a 0, 1 matrix, the adjacency matrix of the graph. Uh, and now this is, a, I call it the pixel picture of the graph. Uh, this is really the same thing as the matrix in the middle, except the zeros are replaced by white squares and the, the ones are replaced by black squares. So you get this kind of looks like a crossword puzzle, this, this picture. Now, here is uh, an example of a random graph. So this is uh, randomness comes in here. Uh, this means that for every pixel, you toss a coin and uh, put uh, black or white, uh, depending on the coin uh, toss, uh, except you have to make it symmetric. So make it symmetric. So that's an erdős rényi random graph. This is, has uh, 100 nodes and 2,500 edges. Um, so these are very important graphs, uh, these random graphs. Uh, but what I would like to mention for you, you make this picture larger and larger. I mean, the number of nodes larger and larger. Eventually, you will see something like a, a, a gray. Uh, and uh, OK, so that's what you see. And uh, this will be the, the limit object, namely, a function on the square, identically one half function on the square. Here is another example that uh, don't worry about the definition. It's some kind of graph that's uh, grown, has a lot of randomness, but not uniform randomness. Uh, uh, the, you, you always throw in new edges and new nodes, so it's a growing sequence of graphs. And uh, again, if you tend with the number of nodes, to, you tend to infinity, you will see something like the picture on the right, which is the grayscale uh, representation of the function 1 minus the maximum of x and y on the unit square. So we can say that in some sense, these, these random graphs, sorry, I have to, to go back, these random graphs on the left turn to this particular function. And so about this more and more similar, we need two things to define. What is the notion of convergence? Now exactly what more and more similar means? And uh, what is a limit object? Uh, now this limit theory is worked out for dense graphs. It's rather well developed. Dense meaning that a positive fraction of all possible edges is present. So any, uh, so there, there are lots of edges in the graph. And uh, here you can do local and global tests and define convergence based on both. And it turns out that these two convergence notions are equivalent, which is actually quite nice and surprising. And the limit objects are these, uh, <coughs> called graphons, and I have already sort of uh, shown you the picture, so they will be two variable functions on the unit square. Bounded degree graphs are probably more important because uh, real life graphs are not dense, but they are usually uh, sparse, often bounded degree. And this is a deep, but at that moment, incomplete theory that are important unsolved questions. And there are, 
there are uh, all sorts of different notions of convergence, also different notions of limit objects, showing that the situation here is much more complicated. And then, of course, you can, you can uh, also talk about the middle ground, what happens to graphs which are neither. So bounded degree means that if you pick a point, it's only connected to um, you know, at most 10 other points. Uh, dense graphs means that if you pick a point, it will usually be connected to maybe 10% of all other points. In the middle ground, you can have other, uh, other uh, number of edges. And I'll talk a little bit, I will talk tomorrow at the, at the, uh, at the institute about, uh, about what, where, how far we are in this middle ground. So for dense graphs, I will uh, just, I, I, I mean, you have to define uh, uh, things here, and, uh, but as you see, the, uh, this is a very intelligent system here. It noticed that uh, it's uh, too late for introducing formulas. <laughs> so it sort of uh, tells me, not, tells you not to worry about the explicit formulas. Uh, uh, but uh, basically the, uh, what it says is that the the test we perform is that we pick a given number of points and look at the subgraph of edges formed by the edges between these points. And uh, this gives uh, certain statistics on these subgraphs. And if this, if this uh, uh, so the probability that you see a particular graph in this test does not distinguish two graphs, then they are similar. And, and uh, uh, this defines a notion of convergence as uh, in the spirit of Avi's talk. Uh, OK, so, so, so there are these densities of f in g. And if the sequence is convergent, then we say that the sequence graphs is convergent, and we say that it tends to a limit uh, w if, uh, if uh, for every f, the density of f in this tends to this w. And again, it tells me that there are now too many, too many formulas. <laughs> um, and it's, everything is nice. If you have a sequence that's convergent, then it there is a limit object and every in the form of this graphon, this is this grayscale image of a function uh, on the unit square. And for every graphon, there is a sequence which, to it, which converges to it. And this is essentially unique uh, technical things. Now, I have to talk, uh, let's see how much time. Uh, but it, I, I still have a little time. So I would like to show what are uh, graph limits good for. So why, why, why do we bother to, to introduce this? And there are, here I listed five of these possible applications. And I will just talk about the first three, which are because of uh, time limits. The one thing is, Existence of optima. So what, what is this? So think of a first year calculus problem. Minimize x cubed minus 6x over non-negative x's. Now probably, well, it's, if it were not so late, you probably most of you would already have computed that the minimum is attained at square root of 2. Uh, you differentiate and solve the quadratic equation that you get. Um, but the minimum is not attained in rational. So going back to the Greek mathematics, if you are a Pythagorean and you came up with this answer, you would be thrown over uh, into, the, into the sea. I mean, that, that, that's not an illegal answer. Uh, so real numbers are useful. So that, that's why it's one of the reasons why it's good to introduce, was good to introduce real numbers. 
Now let's look at uh, an optimization problem for graphs. So let's say we minimize the density of four cycles in a graph with edge density a half. So this means that you have a graph where if you pick two random points, the probability that they are connected by an edge is one half. It's a property of the graph. And then you pick four points and uh, you want to see how often do you get that the first is connected to the second, the second is connected to the third, third to the fourth, and fourth back to the first. So it's a four cycle. Now, and then there is a theorem, I think it goes back to Erdős, probably not in exactly this form, which says that this density is always larger than one sixteenth. And uh, in fact, it gets arbitrarily close to 1 16th for random graphs with uh, edge density a half. So if you uh, take an Erdős-Rényi random graph with edge density a half, you flip a coin for every edge independently, then uh, the expected number of four cycles will be very close to 1 16th, but uh, the actual number will be always larger than 1 16th. Um, so the minimum is not attained among graphs. But this is where graph limits are useful. Because what we looked at, the limit of these erdős random graphs, was this identically one-half function on, on the unit square. And it's very easy to see. I mean, uh, you, you have to multiply four times one-half, and that gaps gives you exactly 1 16th. So this minimizes. So it's not a graph, but it's a limit object which minimizes, which provides the minimum. OK, so minimum is attained on only this graph one, actually. You can also prove that. That will come up in a minute. But uh, so anyway, it's like a completion of a space in mathematical terms. So this is the limit object. Um, now, another thing is that it's very, uh, I mean, obviously the limit on the right hand side is a very simple function. And the limit and the, uh, the, uh, this uh, random construction is somewhat complicated. So suppose I want to know uh, the density of triangles in in the in this uh, in this graph in this finite graph, well, it's it's a rather complicated thing you, to compute. You can compute it approximately, but it's not so trivial. On the other hand, in the limit, you get this. Sorry, no, it was not uh, sufficiently aware that I wrote up actually a triple integral. <laughs> so. Uh, but nevertheless, for this particular function, even to evaluate this triple integral could be a, an exercise, maybe a more advanced exercise in a first year calculus. So you can compute it. I don't uh, write up the result here. It doesn't say much. But the point is, often these limit objects are easier to handle, just like the, our engineer had it easier to compute with a continuous model of the material than with the, with the discrete uh, crystal of uh, uh, network of, of, the, uh, of, of the piece of iron. Now, uh, finally, uh, a few words about finitely forcible because, so, uh, this is a definition, but essentially it says that can it happen that you make some tests, a finite number of tests on, on a graph, find the densities of these, uh, these finite number of subgraphs, and then this, the limit is, uh, or the, 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 the graph one is uniquely determined by that. So the left-hand sides of these equations are some kind of integrals, and the, these, the values of these integrals can it uniquely determine the, the function u. 
Uh, we, we call this for finitely possible with Balar Szegedi, and these are templates for optimal graphs in extremal graph theory somehow. So the first thing is this one, identically one half function. We saw that if you fix the uh, density of edges and the density of four cycles, then, then uh, it forces this particular uh, graph on this particular function on the unit square, and that's a very uh, nice and uh, important theorem of Chung, Graham, and Wilson. Uh, they formulated it in terms of graphs, so it's, it's uh, I, I, this, this one, one advantage is that it this gives a much simpler formulation, but I will not go into this. Uh, and then uh, with uh, Vera Schorsch, we proved that uh, it's uh, sort of these kind of step functions where each step is a, a rectangle uh, with different values. They are all finitely forcible. And we thought for a while that that's all, but formulated the conjecture that, that this is all. But then with Balar Szegedi, we came up with a few more examples, which are, were not of this type. And so we thought, but we, we still formulated a number of questions about them, number of conjectures about how these finitely forcible graphons must look like. Uh, the only theorem we had, and now this is for the mathematicians here, it just says that there are not finitely forcible graphons because they form a set of bare two category and the finitely forcible ones form a set of bare one category. So uh, there are more not forcible than forcible. But we'll see that not many. Here are some explicit examples of not finitely forcible functions. But then, then Kral came in, and these are all his uh, younger collaborators, and they disproved all the conjectures we had in that paper. Uh, and let me just finish with, with uh, showing one of the results. So let's take an arbitrary graphon. Here is a graphon. You think this is a cat, but that's actually a graphon. It's a grayscale image of a function. So take an arbitrary graphon. And now what they prove is that you can put some stuff, you, 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 you shrink it to the upper left quart, quadrant, and then you put uh, some stuff around this. It can, could be defined what you put there, some other graphon. So you embed it in a larger graphon. And it becomes finitely forcible. So any picture can be made finitely forcible by adding some, some stuff around it. And not only finitely forcible, it's always forcible by some constant number. I don't think they compute it, let's say 100. So there is 100 fixed graphs. So that if I tell you the density of, uh, densities of these 100 graphs, then it determines this, this graph on here on the right, and then I cut off the things, and then I get this. So I get an encoding of the left-hand picture just as a sequence of 100 real numbers. And that's really a, a, a most, amazing, uh, most amazing result. And uh, finally, let me mention that there was uh, my, my son, is involved there, and he got some criticism that it's not, not really proper to disprove the conjecture of your own father, but I didn't mind it that much. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Lachi. Um Questions? Wait for the microphone, please. Yeah. Thanks for your uh, speaking. And uh, I have one small question. I'm an outsider for the graph theory, but I can I keep thinking about the fractal, uh, which um, what's the limit of the fractal? I guess it's uh, itself. But uh, is there any meaning to look into the graph 
limit of the uh, fractal itself? Um, well, one, one thing I can answer to this is, uh, I mean, there are, uh, there is a rather natural nice example, I don't have it in, on the sli on these slides, of a, of a rather natural convergent graph sequence whose limit is a fractal. Uh, and it's one of, the, one of the interesting questions of when do you get continuous functions like here and when do you get fractals? Uh, I don't know the answer to this, but, uh, but it, is an, uh, it is a question which is suggested by the examples that we have. Uh, associated to a graph, there is also the spectral problem. So what is the spectrum of the limiting graph? Um, in the dense case, which I was mostly talking about, uh, this is a function on the unit square, which is a kernel function. So you, it defines, I'm sorry, this is now becoming sort of technical. It defines an operator from L2 on the unit square to itself. And uh, the spectrum of this operator is the spectrum of the limit. And it is the limit of spectra of graphs if they converge to this. So, so yes, the spectrum behaves nicely. In the, in the sparse case, there's a lot more problem about the spectrum uh, because uh, there uh, uh, you can define the, I mean, that's, that's becoming really technical, you can define the corresponding operator, but it's not a compact ap operator anymore, so it doesn't have an appropriate spectrum, so it's, it's difficult to define. Wait for the microphone. In, in many applications, we see that uh, people study processes on graphs. Like, uh, so there is a limit theory here. So how would one use this limit theory to study processes on graphs and limit, limits of these processes? How do you visualize like this would benefit this study? This is a truly excellent question, uh, uh, which I, I, I think because uh, with, uh, with uh, Yarik uh, Nezhetshil and uh, Laszlo Barabashi, we just have a, a big project to, with exactly this goal, trying to understand the processes or dynamics on, on, on uh, large networks. Um, I would say, in a sense, we were a little bit sidetracked by the special case of of uh, pandemic spreading on the graph. And so it turns out that even this is a rather difficult issue, but there are, uh, I mean, you can, uh, there are some examples, but they are not really a, a theory uh, where you can understand the process on a large graph by going up to the limit space, and there you find a differential equation that describes this process. So there are some examples of that, but uh, so that would that would again be this idea that uh, that if you if you take uh, go to the limit, then things become simpler. Peter. Thank you for your nice presentation. I'm puzzled by this example of the four cycles you gave. Um, that you always are larger than one over 16 and never equal. Does that mean that in these limits there is a kind of dependency of the following type? Assume I pick three points which are connected by edges A to B, B to C, C to D. It looks that A and D are really somewhat independent. So if you pick edges with probability one half, you would expect 
50-50% of finding an edge. But if this density is larger, it suggests that the probability is actually larger than one half. Do I understand it correctly? Um, uh, yes. Yes. That's what it means. So, what's the origin of this dependency, which looks very strange for a logician? <laughs> um, it would not hold for a five cycle, for example, neither for a three cycle. So there's a bipartiteness which matters here. So the uh, so somehow going back and forth uh, reinforces the possibility that in four in the fourth step you you you, you close. Uh, that's the best I, explanation I can give. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you, uh, Lachi. I'd Lachie. like to say it's, uh, it's interesting that you said that sons like to disprove their fathers. That's good. And it's also good that fathers appreciate that sons are doing that. So thank you very much for your uh, presentation. So that has been a wonderful evening. Um, uh, we have come to the end. I would like to thank, first of all, all four speakers for giving us uh, uh, a beautiful insight into the world of uh, our two uh, laureates. Uh, I'd like to thank you present here on location for coming to Amsterdam and sharing this event with us. I'd like to also thank the online people for being here and uh, and uh, watching this uh, nice event. And finally, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, people at the uh, Royal Academy for hosting this meeting. And you are invited for drinks in the lounge. <laughs>